and those. Thank you, thank you, Josh. Uh, so first thing will be roll call, and I'll just call your names, please, and you say, um, um, you know, here or yay or hooray. Uh, Charlie Glock Jackson, chair. Uh, Jennifer. Jennifer Beard, commissioner. Uh, Samantha. Samantha Kelly, commissioner. Um, Lynn. Lynn Stevenson, commissioner. And uh, Dan. Dan Mozick. Commissioner, and um, Josh, the um, the recording message is in the middle of my screen. Is are others seeing that too? Oh, maybe if I just put continue. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> um, and we also have several guests, and uh, starting with Jennifer Keating and Charlotte from the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. Welcome, welcome. I would like you to introduce yourselves. So, Jennifer. Oxlade Hale, good day. This is Jennifer Keating with the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. I am an enrolled tribal member, uh, land use planner, and assistant tribal historic preservation officer. Thank you for having us. Charlotte? Um, my name is Charlotte Bash. I am also a Puyallup tribal member. Um, I work for the Historic Preservation Department as the Historic Education Coordinator. So I've um, been working a lot with um, quite a few of you on the Tualcash Estuary project. So I'm excited to talk a bit about it. Excellent. Uh, Brandon, welcome. Would you introduce yourself, please? Sure. I'm Brandon Raynon, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Puyallup Tribe. Very good. And um, we have two, three other um, city staff people. Um, well, let the, let the guests continue. I'm sorry. Um, Linda. Oh, I'm Linda Pitcher. Uh, I'm a member of the Honoring Committee and the Pipeline Project Committee and uh, local anthropologist. Um, Linda, we can barely hear you. Is there a way you can maybe turn up your volume or get closer to your mic? I'm at, I'm at full volume. Full volume, okay. Well, lean, lean in, okay. And uh, Lita Dawn. Dawn? Dawn? And unmute, please. Your microphone's not on. There, okay. Uh, Lita Don Stanton, member of the Honoring Committee and part of this pylon silent signage project. Thank you. Welcome. And uh, our three staff members that I did not acknowledge, four that I did not acknowledge earlier. Uh, Mayor Kuhn, would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, Mayor Kuhn of Gig Harbor and working with Resolution 1199, which directs the mayor to work with um, entities that support the educational of uh, the Native Americans in this area that we're working on. Thank you, Mayor. Um, um, Public Works Director Jeff Langham. Thank you. Good morning, Jeff Langham, Public Works Director of the City, uh, here to talk about Harborview Stinson Project. Thank you. And our wonderful Josh. I'm here, Josh Decker, Interim City Clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do, do we have everyone? Has everyone been acknowledged and checked in? Okay, um, first, the next item on the agenda is the approval of two sets of minutes of uh, June 9th and a special meeting on June 11th. Uh, are there any corrections or changes to the minutes of June 9th? If not, may I have a motion to approve? I move to approve. A second to approve. So that's Samantha and uh, Jennifer, Josh, if you didn't get that. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes of the June 9th Arts Commission meeting? Uh, aye. Okay. Aye. Yeah, please just raise your hand and say aye. Good. Uh, we have our quorum. Excellent. Um, and the minutes of the June 11th special meeting. Uh, I trust everyone has read them. Are there any changes or corrections to the June 11th special meeting minutes? I move Seeing to none. approve as submitted. May I have a second? Thank you, Dan. Okay, so Samantha and uh, Dan, 
moved and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand, say aye. Thank aye. you. So we have approved the minutes of the June 9th and June 11th, 2021 Arts Commission meetings. And um, Linda um, um, Sutherland has just joined us, Commissioner Sutherland. Um, so may the record please show that. Uh, so then, moving on to our discussion items. Item number one is uh, an update on the Harborview Stinson Roundabout Art Project with Public Works Director Jeff Langham. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen here real quick, uh, just as a reminder for what we've got going on here for this project. Um, Michelle. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, this is the plan sheet that was put out to bid for the Harborview Stinson project that identified um, the art location and uh, dimensions for this project. So again, there's a panel that is uh, 10 by eight, I believe, uh, in the sidewalk, uh, in the park, this is between the driveway entrance and the um, benching, benches and drinking fountain that go along Harborview Drive just east of the driveway itself. And I'm gonna show you a different picture here in just a minute to help get oriented. But um, this is what the contractor saw when they bid this. And then there's a lot more behind it that you don't need to see and you probably don't wanna see, but there's a lot more details and everything else, but essentially, um, they're keeping open a section of the sidewalk so that uh, it can be easily removed in the future for the artwork that will be placed there by the artist once that moves forward. So I'm going to pause here for a second. I'm going to change my screen. And I'm going to show you for orientation of the entire project. Hopefully you can all see that now. So this is the landscape plan. This is often the easiest one just to refer to because it shows the entire project. Um, so uh, hopefully you're oriented. You can see where there's the Ed and Boat brick house, the, the Ed and Boat shop building itself. Here's the roundabout that's gonna be installed. And uh, here's the driveway uh, going into the Ed and Boat. So again, here's the sidewalk and that art location, if you can see my cursor is going to be right about here. Uh, due to the uh, shoreline mass program, we're required to enhance vegetation along the shoreline in this area. We can't just have grass anymore. So that's why this landscape plan shows uh, quite a few shrubs uh, and ground coverings that are being planted. So um, I was going to jump into the schedule and let you know where we are and what the timing will be on some of these milestones, unless there's any questions on location at this point. Are there any questions from commissioners? Okay, please proceed, Jeff. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Uh, here we go. So uh, we have now open bids for this project. Uh, we had to separate this project into two separate, what we call bid schedules. Uh, there's two separate timings that we need to deal with and pay for it in two different ways. Um, and we're the bids came in higher than anticipated, but we still have uh, enough money to cover the bids. We're going to be proposing the to the city council at their July 26th meeting, the award of this contract, uh, the total contract amount with change or authority and all the construction support was just north of, I think, 2.2, 2.3 million dollars, somewhere in there. Um, what is going to happen at this point is we're going to hopefully receive approval to award the contract. We're gonna give a notice to proceed and uh, start in on our utility relocation work. We have uh, water utilities to relocate, sewer utilities to relocate, and that's gonna be a significant part of the initial part of the project to completely put in a new sewer line. And then we're gonna do some storm work too. Uh, the contractor is supposed to be out on site uh, in the end of August. In fact, it's the Monday following or the week following the Maritime Gig Festival. So we're gonna get the parade over and done with, and then we'll have the contractor out there and, and they'll break ground after that. Um, due to the time it will likely take, 
for the contractor to do all those utility relocates, we will likely have to suspend the contract uh, due to weather because it will, it, uh, what we've anticipated at this point is it will take the contractor uh, a couple months, a few months actually to do all the utility relocation work. Now that said, the contractor, uh, of course, uh, every day they're out there, it costs them more money. Uh, sometimes we've had in the Rosedale Stinson project just earlier this year is a very good example. The contractors might try and con condense schedules uh, in order to get the work done more quickly. And so if the contractor is able to get the utility relocation work completed in a very short time frame, uh, then they may be able to break ground on the roundabout. But right now we anticipate that the utility relocations will occur this end of the summer and into fall. We will suspend the contract for the winter time so we don't have open bare dirt uh, during the rainy season and then re-engage the contractor in, in uh, spring, probably in the March time frame, to break ground on the roundabout. And of course the sidewalk construction is all related to the roundabout construction. So um, if, if that is schedule is adhered to, uh, it's gonna be a good four or five months for the contractor to finish the roundabout. And so we're talking uh, probably about in the late spring, early summer time frame to have the uh, sidewalk and, and everything completed. Okay. So that's our okay. time frame on that. Great. Uh, any discussion on that, commissioners? Lynn. Hey, Jeff, I'm curious. Um, uh, our budget for this art, was it based on a percentage of the budget for that project? And if so, since you have a larger budget now, does that increase the budget for our, our art project? Um, it was not based on percentage of, of contract amount. And if, uh, if, if we were to do that, it, would, it wouldn't adjust based on the bids going up. In fact, it would probably be, be hampered by that because we have to reallocate funds to the project. So okay. I think for the Arts Commission's benefit, it's not tied to the budget because uh, okay. we, I think we set, it, I, we, we set maximum $15,000. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. You're so clever, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any other discussion? So it sounds like um, we should be thinking of um, putting out our call for art. Uh, Jeff, do you think late this year, like December? Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take the artist to do this type right. of work. Um, maybe you would have a better idea on that, of course. But um, I think that preparing the call for art later this year, for sure, and maybe putting it out just before the holidays and uh, awarding it, I don't know, in, in a time frame that is appropriate. But yeah. um, okay. what, would there be harm? I mean, if, if let's just say that the site is ready for the artist to install their artwork in August or something, is that is that gonna be a problem if the artist is done with their work in May and they have to wait until August, September? I don't know. It doesn't seem like it'd be that much of a delay, but. Um, well, that's, I, I, think, I think this isn't the meeting for us to make those decisions um, unless there is more discussion or questions from commissioners about that. My suggestion is because our agenda is so full today um, that we may want to move this forward to our August meeting. Is that all right with commissioners? Okay, it, lo it looks like, like um, that's a good thing. So, okay, uh, any other questions for Jeff? Uh, Mayor Keenan has a question. I oh, yeah. just have a quick question that um, Jeff and I are working with the guy, the artist, um, on his contract and he understands it and it's come to a mutual agreement with the artist. So I just wanted, you know, we can talk about that later, but it's really between us and the artist, but he's happy with the arrangement that we've worked on and we're following the contract. Oh, you're talking about the um, to a wall cut estuary piece. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> okay, any other questions from commissioners to Jeff? Okay, we'll see you probably invite you back to our August meeting, Jeff, um, just so that, cause I'm sure we're going to have questions and we promise we won't 
monopolize your time, but if you wouldn't mind just being available to us for a short while in the, at the August meeting. Well, I'm not sure when your August meeting is. Um, I'm going to be away from the office August 6th through the 13th. Um, let's see. Our meeting is scheduled for the 11th. So, um, well, we'll, we'll, we'll work something out. Okay. Yeah, I won't be in cell service at that time. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Jeff. You bet. I'm going to hang on and just listen to the historic markers update and then... Uh... Oh, yes. Good idea. Okay. Good Thank idea. Um, all right, then. Uh, discussion item number two, the historic markers update. And I will turn this over to um, Lynn. And she can uh, work with our guests. And then um, commissioners, you are, of course, welcome to uh, jump in at any time and ask questions. Okay. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, yeah. Today, um, we're excited to hear the presentation from our group of um, volunteers who are putting together an idea um, for our historic markers project on the pylons in um, the Tualica estuary. So I'll just turn it over to Linda and Don, however you want to proceed. Did I start, Don, and then we'll do the, okay. So I, I guess you're, you're, you're on mute. Sorry. Okay, I'm just gonna say a word or two about myself and then we'll go, go to the- um... So Linda, you're gonna have, we're gonna have to, we barely can hear you. Okay, well, let me do this kit. I'll put, I'll put um, I'm gonna put my video on mute and pull the, Cam, pull my computer right up to my face so you can hear it. So hold on. Is that better? Way better. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'm happy to be here to tell you all about how I came to research and write the panels that tell the story of Jake Harbor's first people. Uh, my name is Linda Pitcher. I am a cultural and medical anthropologist. I did my training at Stanford University and at the University of California, Berkeley. And prior to moving here, I taught at UC Berkeley and UC Davis. I specialized in trauma and the transmission of cultural memory. And, asked, and over the course of 25 years, I have worked in the Middle East with Palestinian refugees, with first and second generation Algerian immigrants in Marseille, uh, with homeless veterans in San Francisco, and with minority elderly populations in Oakland, California. Doing research across cultural boundaries with marginalized and underrepresented communities requires a new, unique set of skills and specific fieldwork methodologies that I have spent a very long time developing. When I moved to Gig Harbor nearly 10 years ago, I took an active interest in local cultures and began working with Croatian, Scandinavian, and other heritage families. And after volunteering at the Harbor History Museum, Soon discovered that very little was known about Gig Harbor's Native American origin. That's when I befriended Lita Don Stanton, uh, who was historic preservationist for the city at the time. In 2013, she had been in touch with the Tuala tribe to invite them to a ceremony celebrating the daylight of Donkey Creek, where the original Native village once was located. She asked me if I'd like to help her produce a brochure about Gig Harbor's first people which I was delighted to do, and even more honored that the Tulalip tribe approved of its use for the daylighting ceremony. Uh, that's how I came to know Brandon Raynon and Nicole Brandon of the, the Historic Preservationist and Educational Outreach Director of the Tulalip tribe. Together, we conducted original research into the Slobabsh band of Paul Oxus. We developed a curriculum about local Native American culture, which I presented in a class I gave six years ago at TCC Gig Harbor. The class was very popular and with more students enrolled than all the other adult education classes combined. And for our last session, Brandon and Nicole were our invited guests and graciously responded to students' questions. I want to be clear that every word I have written or spoken publicly including the proposed panel for the estuary, has been thoroughly vetted and approved by the Tulalip tribe. I know that some of you are concerned that I, as a non-Native person, are writing history for the tribe, 
That most certainly does not characterize our relationship nor the collaborative research that guarantees the integrity of this work. Following the blessing of Donkey Creek and the class that I gave at TCC, I remained engaged with local Native American concerns. In 2018, when the city wanted to relocate West Ulster's totem pole to the museum site, I provided Public Works Director Jeff Langcomb with the research necessary to demonstrate that neither the carving nor the Native American origin myths circulated by our local newspaper were authentic. As the historic preservation representative on the design review board, I argued, I argued before city council and the public and the park commission against the placement of the totem pole at the original village site, as it would have, as it would cause great offense to both the world drive and an accurate telling of our own history. A moment. That same year, Gary Williamson formed a citizens group um, to honor the East Harbor's Native American heritage. Both Lita Dawn and I were part of what became the honoring committee which sought to raise money to commemorate an original piece of Salish artwork um, uh, that recognized the Swabish Ben. We approached the Puyallup tribe once again, seeking their support. And when we were received by tribal council, Chairman Bill Sparrow made the following request of us. He said, if you would like our support of your project, you must be willing to do the work. You must do your research. You must tell the truth, all of it, the whole story, good and bad. Uh, that is what you have in these five panels. It has been a very long process, but it has been a labor of love and a privilege to work with the Tuala tribe. Following Lito Dunn's PowerPoint presentation, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the content. Thank you very much. Excellent. Now I'm going to. Oh, uh, Josh, I'm not sure how the sharing of the uh, image goes if you set it up on your computer or how that work. So you should have a little green button at the bottom of your screen that says share screen. Okay. If you click on that, that'll allow you to share the presentation directly from your computer. So you'll need to have it open first on your desktop and then just click that share screen button and that will allow you to pull it up. So you're sharing something with us, but it's not the presentation. It just says the Zoom meetings is using the webcam. Not yet. Well, you just don't, when you go, I don't know if you did this, but when you hit share screen, there will be multiple options of what to share. And you have to make sure that you're selecting the PowerPoint to share. Showing up on my screen. Right. So I would stop sharing and then go back to share screen and select when the options come up, select the PowerPoint. Do you have the PowerPoint open right now on your screen? So you're right now, it looks like you selected to share the window, the your finder window. Okay, well, it's it's showing on my end. Somehow it's not you are sharing your screen. It's not showing up. Hey, Josh, maybe you could just run it and I could speak to. 
Yeah, just give me one moment, I'll have it pulled up. Sorry about that, guys. Thanks for trying to help, Charlotte. Yes. All right, you should all be able to see it now. Yes, thank you, Josh. Okay, yeah. yeah what I'm gonna do is just say click. Yep. Yeah. That'll put you through. Sorry, guys. Uh, so I'd like to begin by giving you a background on how this project came to be. <laughs> this is a community proposal, not unlike the Bronze Fisherman's Memorial at Scansy Park, that was proposed directly to the mayor and city council by members of the Cultural Arts Commission back in 1999. Like, in 2016, a group of local citizens, you can switch to the next one, led by Gary Williamson, came together with a vision for artwork to commemorate and harvest Native American history. This is the least list of people that was involved and uh, as Arts Commissioner Charlie was part of our group. Next. A sculpture was envisioned to be placed at Boston Park. Click. City Council approved our proposal and anthropologist site history for a call to artists and request for proposals. Click. Native American artist Guy Kapoman was juried in by the Puyallup Tribe and our group in 2018. And these are the drawings we submitted. Next. His work was completed last year. Next. Here's the completed work before it left his studio. Next. And here's public work uh, trucking the figure to the city a few months ago. We had initially planned to encircle the base with interpretive signage about Native American history, but realized that the space was far too limited to tell the whole story. Next. So now let me share the Dumpy Creek Daylighting story that started in 2007, click, and ended with 2013's reopening at the museum site. You can click to the next one. That's before Josh and then the after. I love those two shots. Next. As the city's acting historic preservation officer, I reached out to the people of tribe. Next, and they responded by attending a ribbon cutting ceremony and formally blessing the site. Next, um, it was profoundly moving. Um, it, it included tribal songs and dancing by the Kalamudan family. Next. I don't know how many of you have seen the image of the first Donkey Creek Bridge. We think that's the first one, more than one. Next. And here is the bridge gone and work to fill the creek and left the area for development began. You can also see some of the original piling foundation blocks, um, pylons on the bridge. Next. This angle looks back from the fin side street and shows the 300 foot pipe that the creek was confined to before it was covered with tons of fill. Next. Here you see the pylons that were buried in red. The one that's circled is uh, one of the blocks that was recovered. You can also see a bit of the old bistro restaurant that's now the gourmet burger. It's lying there just to give you an idea of what the site like you're looking at. Here's the bridge under construction, and you can see down below where the original pylon that's sitting in the park was discovered. Next. It was very exciting when the first pylon was unearthed. The city agreed to set them aside and place them in the trail for the future interpretive signage. Next. Next. At the time, I also staffed the Arts Commission and they agreed to set aside a budget for signage. It's been untouched for over four years. I hope the Commission sees our proposal as an opportunity to finish the document. Next. In early spring of this year, the estuary was renamed Walpeth after the original village site. These numbers represent the location of each panel. One is at the entrance to 
for you one of the uh, pylons or combined site into the number for the rest of the harp uh, history site. In combination, the pylons offer a dynamic opportunity to tell the story of the Squamish people as visitors walk through the land they once inhabited. Yes. These images are a little old, but here are the three pylons that will tell the Native American story. Each panel represents a significant period of time. But standing front and in front of the first panel, all three panels will be visible. This is the pilot that sits at the top of the bridge and you can tell a bit of daylighting story. Next. Post sign of each metal panel is 15 by 40 inches. Next. And the inspiration for our design comes from a 1988 installation in Fort Towns. The material is metal inset on concrete pillars. The matte silver finish was engraved lettering and looks nearly new even today. Next. This image shows the scale of Fort Worth's signage. My daughter is quite ten. Next. Our signs feature text only. The font is simple, the spacing and ragged text blocks are designed as rest stops for the eyes of the readers. There are no visual distractions, photos, or illustrations. The text alone will animate the story. Its simplicity is meant to be timeless, beauty of the area and location, shaping the viewer's experience. We assume that some visitors will read all the text, and maybe some won't. The success comes with the installation of a permanent outdoor record that tells the whole story for everyone to enjoy. Next. Linda has done an elegant job of condensing a very complex collection of information. And thanks to Brandon Reyna, Charlotte Bosch, and Jennifer Keating of the Remote Tribe, I believe it offers the most comprehensive record of the school of Bosch to date. And I also want to clarify, clarify that what was perceived as delay or reluctance to share the content of the panels had to do with preventing a digital copy of the story from circulating before the tribes perform. Last week, we completed draft number, I don't know, 28, 29. Although my last email from Charlotte had been some minor changes just this last Friday afternoon. And I made a correction to the Duncan Green panel thanks to input from Rick Spadoni, a museum researcher, just this Monday. The story is written to reflect multiple perspectives. It offers dates and details that anyone can Google if they want to learn more. It's expected that the museum will expand on this important first step to educate residents and visiting tools. And last slide. Just as any other artist comes with a complete proposal, we have been pursuing fabrication bids, and I have a sample of metal for you to review, although on Zoom it doesn't, isn't very effective. Uh, Sandblasting three centimeters of concrete for the inset design is charged uh, per square foot at three dollars. Uh, based on what we know, we are confident that your existing budget will more than cover installation costs. Uh, we ask that you consider that our proposal for pilot uh, signage and will welcome questions after Charlotte and other members of the tribal council tribe have had an opportunity to speak. So Charlotte, whoever else is speaking, take it away, please. Thank you. Yeah, I just, of course, my dog starts barking right when I unmute myself. Um, let me close my door real quick. Thank you for all of that background information. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit to our involvement. And I think um, Brandon and Jen can talk a bit 
about before I was pulled in um, as a historic education coordinator. Um, I have a lot of hats, but part of one of my hats is to work with um, local jurisdictions, parks, museums, um, when they want to incorporate um, any interpretation on tribal history. So I was pulled in on this project um, back in, I was checking my email in March. So it's been a handful of months here. And like um, Lita Dawn said, there has been over 20 drafts circulated between us. So um, we're very appreciative to all of the work that um, Linda did in researching tribal history with Brandon, with Nicole, um, who was in our department prior to uh, my arrival at the tribe. Um, so there's been a lot of research that went in and then Linda with her compiled research I and mean, compiled text shared her drafts with us. And I think we went back and forth. Um, we have met, I don't know, maybe every other week for the last few months, um, reviewing the text. And it's really um, been a labor of love. And because of that, you know, we have put so much work into making sure that this is um, the story that we we tell about ourselves. This is not someone else's story. This is not um, someone else's perspective of Puyallup or Sohobab's history. Um, this is the history that um, is not often told. And so we are recommending that the text be um, approved as is, um, because a lot of hours went into even changing tiny, tiny, tiny little things. We put a lot of effort into it. Um, so this is really, you know, we're all very proud of this work. Um, I want to invite Jen to speak a little bit about her perspective as a Gig Harbor community member, as well as a tribal member um, and anything else you'd like to add. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, so first off, thank you, Lita Dawn and Linda Pitcher for the hours and hours and hours of time and energy that you've put into this and the back and forths with the tribes. Um, that's exactly what it takes to get the, a product that is as comprehensive um, and accurate as what you have. And I will say this is the first time this has been done. As someone who I am born and raised on Fox Island, so I am a graduate of the Peninsula School District. I now have choose to raise my children in the Peninsula School District. I am our Indian Ed coordinator, I'm our parent representative for the school district. I cannot tell you enough how necessary this information is. When our children learn about tribal history, it's literally taken state legislature to ensure that they're even allowed that opportunity. Because growing up in Gig Harbor, Native students were removed from the classroom because our history was simply not important enough to be taught to non-Native children. We were taken into hallways or libraries and the few students that um, attended the school were then given tribal history opportunities. That's not acceptable because as we all know, native history, Puyallup history is Washington state history. And by failing to teach that, we're failing to teach our children their state history. Um, we're failing to learn from that history. We're failing to understand why things are, we're failing to understand why uh, the impact of, of discovering thousands of native American children's graves, what is that? I literally have adults reaching out to us asking, what's a residential boarding school and why weren't we taught about that in school? So this is Gig Harbor's opportunity on the, on the um, behind Mayor Kuhn, who has gone above and beyond to, uh, for the first time ever in Gig Harbor, introdu introduce Indigenous Peoples Day, Native American Heritage Month, uh, the name, restor name restoration of Tualukas Estuary, um, and then even the school naming uh, that recognizes the Swiftwater, Swiftwater Elementary is now named after the Swiftwater Band of Puyallup. So Gig Harbor is at a really cool, unique place right now. And I'm incredibly proud of our, of, of, um, our community. I actually brought my, my father who's a great up digger and I can, I can tell you stories of how he would be yelled at by Gig Harbor and Fox Island residents as they were practicing their tribal fishing rights. Um, the horrible things that were screamed at my father and family as they practiced those rights, uh, bringing him down to the site of where that name restoration occurred um, and seeing these pylons and telling him that this is a possible project. This actually brought my father who I've never seen cry to tears. So this is an incredibly impactful project and I thank you all for even considering it. Um, it's a very proud day to be Puyallup and a Gig Harbor uh, community member. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jennifer and Charlotte. Brandon, would you like to say something? Uh, I really cannot add to anything to those just spectacular words we heard from uh, these two women. And so uh, just echo what they said. And, uh, you know, just really proud to, to hear, I mean, how awesome it is that not just uh, Piaulp saying it, but hearing uh, you, you uh, people from Gig Harbor speaking our language to Alcuth and Skobops just being uh, inter interchangeably used and saying it correctly. It's amazing. Uh, and our and our ancestors would be extremely proud for uh, what what work has been done by our staff, but also by uh, you all as well. And uh, we're really proud of, of this work that uh, like uh, Jen and Charlotte both stated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Kuhn, do you have anything to say? I'm just really proud that in this time of history, we've gotten to this point. And um, it's an honor to be part of this group uh, at this time. So thank you for everyone that's come together to make this uh, a reality. Thank you. Uh, are there any comments or uh, questions from arts commissioners? Uh, if not, then um, Don and uh, Linda, thank you very much for the um, PowerPoint and uh, uh, tribal members. Thank you so much for honoring us with your presence today. Let's move on to review the proposed text for the pylons. And Josh, probably you will need to bring that up uh, as well on your screen. Can you share that with us? Yeah, give me one more moment. Sure. And um, can, can someone read it? Uh, because I think it's better read than just each person reading it. If if, if that's what they were proposing. It will go quicker, I think. And my preference would be to have someone read it whose microphone is, is um, e easy to understand. So uh, perhaps Jennifer or, or Charlotte or Brandon, um, it's your story. Would, would any of you be willing to read it? <clears throat> I'm tag team, Jen. <laughs> I was just thinking that. Great minds. You wanna kick us off? We'll do every other one. Okay, before Gig Harbor, the Aboriginal history of the Pacific Northwest dates back over 10,000 years. Since before recorded time, members of the Puyallup, Nisqually, Muckleshoot, Skokomish, Stilicum, and Squaxin Island tribes have understood the Southern region of Puget Sound as one, of, as one great and interconnected watershed. Amidst a topography of mountain peaks, rivers and streams, tides and drainage systems, Coast Salish people were and continue to be stewards of the environment. Their routines and daily practices guided their, by their proximity to and interaction with the running waters. They were people of the salt water who resided along the seashores, river people who inhabited the banks of rivers and streams, inland people who moved from riverbed to riverbed, and people of the prairie who raised horses and traveled over land. Saltwater, river, inland, and prairie were distinct systems of knowledge necessary to life and prosperity around the Salish Sea. Local tribes were blessed with an abundance of natural resources, a mild climate that allowed for seasonal hunting, tidelands rich with shellfish, rivers teeming with salmon, a surplus of berries and edible roots, and an endless supply of cedar trees, which they use for shelter, clothing, and transportation. Grateful for these gifts, they were mindful not to waste what the creator had provided and regular hosted gui gui, ceremony, ceremonial feasts of giving or potlatches to share their bounty with others. Unlike the larger warfaring tribes to the north, inhabitants of this region belong to smaller autonomous tribes and bands. With a wealth of sustenance readily available, competition between them was limited and conflict was rare. The selection of village leaders was based on merit rather than lineage and women played an important role in public life. Tribes and bands were affiliated through intermarriage, territorial agreement, trade, material culture, and language. Their ethnicities were determined not by blood, but by their location on the life-giving watershed and their relation to one another. To this day, solidarity, sustainability, and a shared responsibility for the environment remain central to the identities of all Coast Salish people. Quick question. Um, are we wanting to pause after each pylon 
to discuss or are we wanting to discuss at the very end or how, how would the commission prefer to go about that? Uh, my preference would be to go through the whole thing so that we don't lose um, the rhythm and the, um, the fragrance of the language. No problem. I mean, certainly we can make notes if we have questions, but I'd, I'd rather not disrupt the flow. Great, okay. Um, Squabosh, Swiftwater people, here where the creek flows into the bay of full, in full view of Tacoma, Mount Rainier, is the ancestral home of one of Western Washington's significant yet little known indigenous groups, the Squabosh Band of Puyallup Indians. They spoke the Tulshootseed dialect of the Coast Salish language, Lashootseed, and their village on the site was named Tualwakuk, meaning place where game exists. It was a large village spanning most of the harbor and just one home of a group who also inhabited villages from Vashon Island to Alacha Bay. On, on these forested shores, the Squabach village consisted of several buildings, communal longhouses averaging 100 feet in length and smaller structures, 30 foot square, which housed individual families or were used for other activities. The distinction of the Squabach and their unique place amongst other indigenous peoples of the region is best revealed in the translation of their name. From the root word squab, meaning swift water, and opsh, meaning people, they were guardians of the turbulent narrows passage, stretching from Point Defiance to Wallachet Bay, charged with protecting all who resided along the adjacent shores. You wanna scooch up for me, please, Josh? As master canoe builders and experienced navigators, it fell to them to defend the southern entrance of the Salish Sea. They also maintained a fortified encampment on the tip of the nearby Mori Island. The Skovach people with gill nets and weirs fished with gill nets and weirs within the harbor and at river outlets. During the warmer months, they harvested food from local forests and hunted deer, elk, bear, and other game from summer camps farther afield. As the weather turned cold, they returned to the main village, gathering in the longhouse to recount the stories of winter. These stories passed from generation to generation, communicated the Skovach virtues of resiliency, flexibility, compassion, and stewardship. Unlike the experience of most frontier towns on Puget Sound, interaction between the Skovach and non-native settlers was at times peaceful. Perhaps this was because Gig Harbor was settled by recent immigrants before westward bound pioneers arrived, or perhaps it was because a number of early Croatian fishermen married Native American wives. The local Skobops were welcoming toward the settlers, offering their longhouse as a shelter for Gig Harbor's first children, or I'm sorry, first, where'd it go? First school room. In 1885, the first class consisted of five Native and five settler children. Unfortunately, as settlers continued to arrive, the Skobops were ultimately pushed off their homeland and onto the newly established Puyallup Reservation. By the turn of the 20th century, only 50 Skobops still resided here at the head of the bay. The Puyallup tribe. The Puyallup are known for being generous and welcoming people. Their name in the Shootseed, Puyallupov, translates to people from the bend at the bottom of the river. Prior to Euro-American colonization, Puyallup resources were so abundant that it was often said, when the tide is out, the table is set. Meaning that when shellfish and other blessings from the sea are available, all are invited to come. From the arrival of George Vancouver in 1792, through the establishment of the Hudson Bay Company in 1833, to the Wilkes Expedition of 1841, the Puyallup tribe extended friendship to newcomers and readily engaged in cultural and material exchange. But early explorers introduced more than trade and new place names to the region. European diseases such as smallpox, malaria, and measles spread quickly among Coast Salish peoples. By 1846, the year Puget Sound was annexed by the United States, an estimated 90% of the indigenous population had perished. Those who survived faced an equally daunting fate. Before Europeans and, Amer and American colonists came to settle the Western frontier, the notion of individual land ownership did not exist among native peoples of this region. The earth was imbued with spirit and considered sacred. For millennia, the social, economic, and agricultural practices of the Puyallup and other area tribes ensured the health of the ecosystems, ecosystem and promoted cooperation between communities. 
but non-native settlers knew little of sustainability. They sought to control and develop lands they perceived to be feral and largely uninhabited. The Do Donation Land Claim Act of 1850 drew thousands of pioneers to the Pacific Northwest, promising 360 acres to those who established residence and cultivated the land. As a result, tensions grew as Coast Salish communities witnessed homesteaders clearing forests, planting fields, building fences, and destroying marshlands. The U.S. government acted quickly to quell any discontent because the success of America's westward expansion depended upon the wholesale compliance of Native peoples. You can scroll a little bit. In 1854, Isaac Stevens, the governor of Washington Territory, gathered representatives of nine area tribes and bands to sign the Treaty of Medicine Creek. Amongst them was Gig Harbor's own Schwabsch, under the guise of a potlatch, Stevens presented tribal leaders with an ultimatum, poorly communicated through a pidgin trade language known as Chinook jargon. Relinquish all claim to your ancestral homelands and accept confinement onto three small reservations designated for the Puyallup, the Nisqually, and the Squaxin Island tribes in exchange for U.S. recognition of native fishing and hunting rights. Those who refused were threatened with the promise of war. While few tribal members placed their X upon the papers, none understood the magnitude of what they had been forced to sign away. By 1855, Nisqually Chief Leshai led the charge to resist the treaty's enforcement and Puyallup, Nisqually, Squaxin Island, Yakima, Muckleshoot, and other tribal warriors rose to defend their homelands. This provoked the US Army to intern over 1,200 non-warfaring Indians on Fox Island. The ensuing treaty wars resulted in bloodshed on both sides before feuding parties reassembled on Fox Island to call for peace. Puyallup Chief, Chief Squatahan negotiated to improve the original terms of Medicine Creek, insisting that reservation land be granted to the Muckleshoot and enlarging the Puyallup Reservation to encompass an area that today spans the cities of Tacoma, Puyallup, Fife, Milton, and Edgewood. The Schwabaj were expelled from their homes and placed with their neighbors on the Puyallup Reservation, a tribe to whom they were closely related but culturally distinct. In the end, the treaty confiscated over 2.4 million acres of Native American territory, including 1,200 acres of bayfront property around Gig Harbor. After Medicine Creek, the completion of the Northern Pacific Railway in the 1880s combined with the Homestead Act's initiative incentive to grant government seized lands to industrious settlers brought an even greater wave of pioneers to the Western frontier. By the 1920s, the city of Tacoma and the regional economy were booming, but it was a terrible time for the local Skobaj, the Puyallup tribe and all indigenous peoples of the state. Should indigenous be capitalized? I think there's a debate in the formatting world right now. Okay, okay, well, come on. sorry, I apologize. And all indigenous peoples of the Salish Sea, the rapidly expanding timber industry decimated the salmon runs of their rivers and streams. Mills and factories polluted the estuary flats where they harvested shellfish and the U.S. Army denied them passage through, through their traditional hunting grounds. Within a generation, the Treaty of Medicine Creek had transformed once independent, self-sufficient Coast Salish tribes into wards of the state. As poverty spread throughout the reservations, the Dawes Act of 1887 divided community, communally held tribal lands into individual family allotments that could then be sold to non-Native prospectors. The legislation was presented as an opportunity for the Native community to ease their suffering. Its effect was just the opposite. Allotments were sold for cents on the dollar and the tribes were stripped of what little land they had left. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, the Bureau of Indian Affairs maintained a rigid, sta a rigid standard of cultural assimilation. Native American children were taken from their families and forced to attend English only boarding schools. This was a devastating blow to Coast Salish peoples. Could you scoot up the screen please, Josh? Thank you. At these schools, native languages were forbidden, discipline was severe, physical labor was mandatory, and students were Christianized. Over time, Indian youth could no longer communicate with their parents nor learn the traditions and wisdoms of their tribe. A policy of Indian termination guided federal legislation from the 1940s to 1950s, 
Laws like the Termination Act of 1953 and the Indian Relocation Act of 1956 sought to end U.S. treaty obligations, undermine tribal sovereignty, and drive Native Americans off the reservations and into urban centers where they could be absorbed into mainstream culture. In the 1960s, tribes organized to reclaim rights guaranteed to them for over a century. In 1964, Puyallup members staged their first fish-in to protest the Department of Fish and Wildlife's denial of their access to local rivers and streams as prescribed by the Treaty of Medicine Creek. For more than a decade, these protests spread throughout Puget Sound, bringing national attention to the many unfulfilled promises made to Native communities. The Bolt decision of 1974 upheld the fishing rights of Native Americans, granting Washington tribes 50% of all fisheries harvested from Washington waters and splitting the management of shared natural resources between the tribes and the state. It was a significant first step toward acknowledging rights guaranteed to area tribes, but the ruling exacted a heavy toll on native and non-native communities alike. For both non-native and native fishermen, restricted access to local fisheries caused many families to lose their livelihoods. For the Puyallup and other local tribes, the decision recognized only half of the fisheries that had once sustained their people. As of 2021, the Puyallup tribe is a sovereign nation of over 5,000 members strong, many of whom are descendants of the Kobach. After centuries of struggle and perseverance, they have emerged a thriving and vibrant people committed to supporting the well being of their community. Towards this goal, the tribe has established lasting institutions to ensure the health and prosperity of their people for generations to come, including Chief Leshai Schools, the Puyallup Tribal Health Authority, Marine View Ventures, and the Emerald Queen Casino, amongst others. These endeavors provide vital services to both tribal members and non native communities. The annual canoe journey promotes the cultural awareness of all residents throughout the Pacific Northwest. The Puyallup Tribal Fisheries Department helps preserve the natural environment for everyone. The tribe also supports culture, historic preservation, and language departments where Puyallup people are free to learn their history, traditions, and native tongue. Last one, the daylighting of Donkey Creek. In the early 1900s, Charles Osgood Austin leased the land under what is now the Harbor History Museum, Midway Schoolhouse, and surrounding tide flats to build his lumber mill when all that remained of the native village was a longhouse. The mill specialized in lumber, shingles, and log homes and provided stable employment to many men in the community. In partnership with Charles' son, son-in-law Eric Erickson, the family built Austin Erickson vertical log structures, which became popular architecture throughout the area. The city of Gig Harbor named Austin Park to honor the Austin family's contributions to the town. Originally known as North Creek to non-native settlers, the city also renamed Donkey Creek Park after the donkey steam engine that powered the winch used by loggers to drag heavy timber through, steams, through streams and across the land to Austin Mill. Prior to 1943, a bridge made of timber spanned a small creek that flowed freely from its headwaters through a salmon-bearing estuary and into Gig Harbor Bay. In 1950, the old wood bridge was removed and its concrete support blocks were covered over with tons of earth to create surface area for new buildings. At that time, the creek was rerouted into a 36 inch pipe and buried deep below a new roadway. For 40 years, salmon made their way up the 300 foot long pipe to spawn in Donkey Creek. Yeah. In 2008, the city initiated a project to rebuild the bridge and daylight Donkey Creek. During excavation of the site, five of the original bridge's foundation blocks, known as pylons, like this one, were recovered and placed along the trail through the museum site, Austin and Donkey Creek Parks. Four of the five panels on the, on the concrete pylons tell the story of Gig Harbor's Native American history. And while the creek bed could not be fully restored to its natural state, significant improvements have reestablished critical habitat for juvenile salmon that swim up the stream from the Tualcush estuary below. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and um, Charlotte for um, um, bringing to life the um, extraordinary history that uh, is um, included on these pylons. Um, so now I will open the discussion to um, uh, Arts Commission members to uh, make any comments or questions, suggestions that um, are on your mind. 
Yeah. Lynn. Um, I just, I, there was a few things that I made notes of just are more sort of type things. I don't know how much we want to get into the details like that today, or do we want to do that or? Um, let's see if there are, um, um, substance changes. Okay. Okay. Suggestions. Cause I, I agree. I, there are some typo things that um, we may be seeing the same things, but any um, any discussion about the Robin? Hi, I'm sorry I was a little late joining the meeting, um, but glad to be here. And thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. And I did look at the slideshow. Um, I have a question that maybe was answered earlier, but the beautiful prose that is just gorgeous with the story that we're telling here. So I have a few thoughts. <clears throat> One, just the last two paragraphs that were read, is it intended that you go through the pylons one through five and that those are at the end? Uh, I understand what I'm asking. I got a lot of blank faces. <laughs> I'm looking to lead a daughter, Linda, to answer that. Mm -hmm. The last panel that was read sits up on the pylon that's located at the top of the bridge. So you will actually be looking over the Twalalka uh, estuary. So, so if you, I mean, it all depends which direction you come from, whether you see it first or second, right? Or first or last, is that correct? Uh, each of them can be read independently. So the reason I'm asking is that those last two paragraphs that talked about what it was prior and what it became, felt like, uh, this is the journalist in me, the old journalist in me, that felt very um, important as an overview wrap up of what you were all looking at. So somehow I was wondering if there's a way to, hi to highlight that um, so people read that first and then the rest kind of fills in. So that's one thought or just that I wanted to share. The second was is that <clears throat> the story is so beautiful I'm thinking of other ways that we could share the whole story, um, such as um, a, a QR code that links to a website, um, which, um, because it's a lot for people to take in. Um, and while I, lo I love the layout and the way the, the plaques are being positioned on the, on the pylons, um, I'm wondering if there's a way that that we can also share that in another media. So people have an opportunity to either reflect back on it after they leave or to read it before they go. Um, and then it becomes part of a living history of the city if it's on the website, um, either on the city website or the Arts Commission website link. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts about that. May I answer what uh, current information I have on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be great. Thank I met with Stephanie Lyle and she read through the panels and is excited to uh, coordinate that, that more information be available through the museum. We haven't discussed exactly how that link occurs, but then I understand that uh, Mayor Kuhn, you were going to put some kind of signage at the entrance to the park that had information, maybe that's where a QR code could reside. Um, the concern with uh, engraving anything on the panels themselves is that technology changes. So uh, being thoughtful about how that link is made um, is important. Okay. I yeah. think it is important mm -hmm. to um, do kind of a, a layout map at the beginning of each, at the beginning, uh, when you come off the sidewalk into where it says Austin Park, or you come right under the bridge or right before under the bridge from Donkey Park, you have an educational sign that basically lets you know what you're walking into. Basically, so there is no front and there is no end. So it will actually say where the honorary sculpture is. It will say where the voice box is. It will say where these markers are so that people don't miss something. So, yeah. And yeah. I think as Don and Rob, as everyone's pointed out, um, I think there's many ways we can um, make this grow. But I, I think um, in the essence of making this happen one place, 
we can we can let that grow after we've maybe made one initial made this this pylon project happen and then figure out how we can grow it afterwards so that we don't you know wait for some grand thing that maybe doesn't happen you know as don said we work with the history we work with the history museum we get it on the city site well, um, we have to work with the artists of this, which is uh, Don, Linda, and the tribe, because it is their work. And but make make sure that um, we can get this further in other locations. Uh, one thing, I, last thing, I would want to point out, which um, I don't I don't care too how much this is, but you know I did call Jeff, and it, it, there is a high chance that two of these pylons sit on the History Museum property. So um, I'm glad to know that Lita shared this with Stephanie, because we either have to get permission from the museum to put it on these two pylons that are on their site, um, which I think is preferable, or we don't put it on those two um, <laughs> pylons. But I, I still, we still need to share it with the museum, uh, because as people have said, they, people will think it's, it's, a, um, and it's, it's an extension of them. So we have to recognize that they're right there too. Right, right, right. So um, are there any other um, um, uh, commissioner comments or discussion? Pr primarily about the content, the, um, the text itself. I think our, our mission today is to um, approve the text as written um, and to make sure that we all agree. And it's very important to me personally that the Puyallup tribe has already seen this and um, spent many, many hours, many months uh, making sure that it's accurate and true and um, valid and honest. And um, uh, knowing that they have um, given their approval to this text is very, very important to me. And I'm, um, uh, personally, I'm okay with approving the text. And then things like, um, uh, Lynn, you have some, um, um, I'm sure some typo things that you're thinking about. I don't think that we need to discuss all that right now. I think our mission today is to approve the text um, and then um, um, we can take over from there. Jeff Any might have some insight too. Anytime staff has a comment, I jump on it because uh, it gives us direction. Right. I, thank you, Mayor. I was just going to mention following up from Robin's comment of, uh, and the response about QR codes. Just as an aside, when we, the city has looked at placing QR codes on what be semi-permanent or permanent signs, uh, we have been able to successfully put stickers on those that are weatherproof so that if we need to change them, if technology changes, as Dawn has stated, uh, or the website has, has changed, we can fairly easily do that. So non-engraving is a good suggestion, but to put some weatherproof stickers on there would be good. Excellent idea, Jeff. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, so is there any other discussion about the text? The, the contents of the text. I'd um, like to say thank you for both Linda, Don, and the tribe. I think you've done an awesome job. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, is it appropriate then for us to have a motion to approve the proposed text for the five pylons? Um, Dan? Put your, please put your mic on, Dan. Wait, we still can't hear you. Got it. There you go, okay. okay. I move that we accept the text as written. Uh, is there a second, Lynn? Okay. okay. Is there any other discussion from among arts commissioners? Um, in that case, all in favor of approving the text as written and submitted. Um, Samantha, did you have a comment? Okay, uh, let's ra raise your hand, say aye if you approve. So one, aye, aye. Two, three, aye. four, five, six. Linda, your hand is up. Okay, we have unanimous approval of the text.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda and Dawn, for many years, many months. Linda, I know you've spent on what seems like a lifetime, probably, um, researching this. And um, what an extraordinary job you've done. And um, uh, Jennifer and Charlotte and Brandon, um, thank you for bearing with us and making sure that we get it right. Um, it's your story and um, we are very, very privileged to tell it. And if we put, um, if we do, I love Jeff's solution to putting a sticker for a QR code. I might also suggest that that be linked perhaps to the tribe's website if you feel that's appropriate. Thank you. Um, I was actually just gonna recommend that. Um, the tribe, thanks to people like Charlotte and Brandon, is an absolute wealth of information. And we have links that can go from anything from constant language updates with, with more and more information and research being done. Um, it would be the most up-to-date place to link folks to go for information on language, on histories, stories, cultural events. Um, I highly recommend linking it to the tribe's website. And that's also the only place where tribal history is being told by the tribe. Perfect. That's perfect. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a moment, Lita. Lynn, you had your hand up. I just, yeah, I just wanted to thank um, Charlotte and Jennifer and Brandon and uh, Dawn and Linda for what was obviously a very tedious um, um, and rightfully so um, process. These things it require that kind of dedication and um, and everything else that came out of it, which isn't always pleasant, but it, it the the end product really really shows and it in the heart and soul that it, that it comes through. Ugh, it's making me emotional. So and and Jennifer, the story about your father, that just wow. you know, that just did it for me. Like that says it all. So this is why um, we are, I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing this. Uh, thank you for doing all of that uh, for us. It's, I hope it serves the tribe and our environment and our future and the city of Geek Harbor very well in the future for, for a long time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dawn, you had, uh, you had your hand up? Yeah, I had a question. I uh, understand the text to be approved, which is just fantastic. Thank you so much, all, everybody involved. Um, are you, uh, does that mean that the format, meaning the 15 by 40 metal signs is not part of that approval process? So they could end up circular or knows what I mean I I'm just wondering how how that works or whether or not there's an opportunity to work with the um, subcommittee that's uh, taking on the project or what's what the next steps are Lynn yeah I um, I'm, yeah I'm open to any comments I think it, at this point um, we I would assume the subcommittee will just work out those details and obviously we'll start with where you are with the, the uh, uh, materials and your ideas and, and um, see if anything else evolves from that or, you know, we'll have to work with finding um, the estimate cost estimates and things like that and working within our budget. So uh, I'm just assuming that we'll go back to the subcommittee to start hashing out those details. Is that correct? Uh, that sounds good to me. And um, if other uh, arts commissioners, I, I think, should also have the opportunity to weigh in so that um, uh, with the subcommittee's lead, the entire commission is involved. I'd I'd like to know too from either Josh or Jeff where the next steps are because you know I don't that's not my job so I don't I don't know you know the art commission can absorb the can accept this 
but um, at one point they go to then they um, direct the city or advise the city as the, as their group is. So I'd like just to follow the the structure. I have to follow the structure of the city. So I'd like to know um, after Linda's question from Josh or Jeff what what the steps are as well. Linda. We can't, would you put your mic on, Linda? Thank you. Yeah, I'm just so happy everybody is pleased with the text. Um, and, and I'm feeling the power of this moment too. Um, I do want to uh, um, repeat that, we're, that this pylon project is, is presented as both text and design. And that's what we're submitting to the Arts Commission for approval. Acknowledged. Um, thank you. Um, so Jeff um, and or Josh, um, to continue the discussion about the mayor's question, our, our next step is? Well, I'll, I'll try to weigh in a little bit and maybe Jeff can correct me if, he, if he's on a different page, but I think we need to have a conversation administratively with staff on how we're gonna do this. Um, won't be up to the Arts Commission to go out and select bids and, and find out how we're going to produce these and pay for them. Um, we need to make sure that we're following the requirements we have as the city, um, that we're using the correct uh, vendor, have a contract in place to actually produce these. Um, that's a conversation I don't think we've had really at this staff level, so we'll need to have that before we um, start down that road. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with Josh, and I just wanted to add that it should at least be presented to the Parks Commission at some point. Right, thank you. Thank you, Jeff and uh, Josh. We need your leadership and guidance to keep us um, within the rules and regulations. So- okay. two, two questions on that. Because um, I've presented things to the, Art, to the Parks Commission. Um, but it's, it's um, can it be presented to the art uh, to the parks commission as something like uh, before, like we uh, we would like your blessing, um, because they've already they've already actually in resolution eleven eighty four they already gave us direction, and mm -hmm. I know that some people wanted to be called um, Twalaka Austin Meadows or. So I don't want them to, this is, this is this group's project. And uh, I don't want it to be changed to another group. And as you clearly pointed out to them last time, when we were giving them the name of uh, Tualacot Estuary, it was, it was to get their support, whether they wanted to do that or not, we were moving forward. And, and the 1184 does state, wherever it is, it's, it's in my hand, that um, they, already are, they already gave direction. So can we go to them as we would like your blessing as opposed to, um, you know, beat this thing around a lot more. This is the art commission, uh, citizen, the tribes project. Right, um, Kit, it seems to me like um, we can just give them an update. Um, this is where we are and this is where we're going. Um, and, um, and thank them for their past support and, and approval of this project. Uh, Josh, Jeff, does that sound? Yeah, generally, I, th I would agree. It's, it's more of a, an informational. I mean, the, the, the Parks Commission can't stop any projects from moving forward. They don't have that role. They okay. can advise. Great. So we can present it in a, in a very um, positive, in a way that gets their blessing. If right. you, you approach it the right way. Also, question, Lita, you had an you had someone that you were thinking about wanting to actually produce the panels. Do you since we have to go through? I, I guess Josh said, uh, uh, people that are listed with the state. Um, do you know if this gentleman is or this person is? No, like an, any artist who comes and proposes a project. As an example, the uh, Nordic boat that's down at that Finholm Public Works landing. Jeff, are you familiar with that? Uh, he didn't come to the city and then have to go by prevailing wage to bid his uh, aluminum. He came to the city with a finished product and, and 
it was built in to his cost doing the project. So um, I would recommend that the subcommittee look into keeping the design and the text intact so that as you look through vendors, it comes through as uh, an art project. Do you follow me, Jeff? Because if you start to dismantle the pieces of that puzzle, you will go into prevailing wage, which will shoot the cost uh, up and uh, I, I would I would make a comment if I may on that. Well, just maybe um, I can clarify that um, I, I think what Josh Jeff, were you going to respond? Can you hear me? Looks like our screen is. Yes, we can hear you, Jeff. Locked. Okay. So um, I totally agree what, what Don is referring to. I don't think that's in conflict with what Josh was saying. Um, Josh just want, I think was saying we need to follow our purchasing policies and you're absolutely correct, Don. This is a, 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 a purchase. It's not a public works project by any means that requires prevailing wages. It's not at all what this is. We're just looking for a vendor. You use the right term. It's a vendor that we're looking for to provide a finished product that will be installed. Um, and so we just need to make sure that we advertise that in the proper way and follow our procedures. Right, and, and, and I would add, if I might, that the, um, the uh, Nordic symbol, uh, the dream vessel at the Bogue uh, viewing platform and other art projects were done as an actual call for art. Um, so there was a, a, a proposal presentation process that the Arts Commission in the city went through. This, there has not been a call for art or a call for proposals for this. So uh, I think we're working with um, perhaps a slightly different context. So, so I'm glad we got that clarified. Um, with that, does the motion need to be changed a little bit to include more of the text? Or can that just be done from the subcommittee of the Art Commission with uh, with the group that's presenting this, I just so that we um, get that whole thing thing through. Do you follow me? Does it have to be a motion to approve the text in the manner that it is, in the format, um, so that then it can move forward on that, so that we don't have to come back? Robin, do you have any? You're looking, Robin. You're looking like you want to make a comment. Okay. Um, and Lynn. Um, just want to clear up my little confusion. Um, <laughs> I'm not having much luck. Uh, I don't feel like we can approve of the whole package when we don't know what costs we're approving of, I guess. Okay, well, you work with like it separately then? I get, yeah, wait, wait what, sorry, what did you say, Mayor? Then work with that separately later on. I, I think that we have to, like, I mean, since we're managing a public budget, I, f I feel like we don't have enough information yet to finally, finally approve, because we don't quite know what we're approving yet as far as the expense, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we could all agree the materials sound really great, but none of us knows what we're talking about as far as cost yet. Would you like to see a breakout like we did for our, um, you know, our, oh gosh, our Endeavor grants? Would you like to see like, um, like overhead and budget and tools and all that sort of stuff, like a big cost, like a bill or something, right? I think that's what we need to yeah. put together that yeah. Yeah. so, so that the whole commission is aware of what we're approving. Um, right. And, the costs are all wrapped up into that approval. Is that right? And, and I think that that direction will come from Josh and Jeff. Well, um, that's where I'm confused. Okay. Well, Josh, what, Josh what are the next steps? So it's an arts commission project. So what are the next steps specifically? I, I would say let um, staff get together and let us figure out what we need to do to move this forward to the next step. And then we can come back to you um, I don't know that you need to be that concerned about budget. I mean, there's a there's an allocation of four thousand, but if it's more than that, I think we have um, we have the latitude to work with that. So I don't think that the arts commission needs to be concerned with budget necessarily. Um, it's just we need to figure out procedurally what we have to work with, and then come back to you with huh. the options. 
Um, uh, Dawn. Um, would it be possible for Linda and I to meet with the subcommittee to pass forward the information that we've done on fabrication and costs and just get, give you the information and have a dialogue about it? I think you can just send that to us and then we can we can review it. I'm sure you already have a, um, it sounds like you've done a pretty thorough job of um, meeting with a potential supplier fabricator. So if you'll just share that information with, uh, with Lynn and Samantha and then they can share it with the rest of the commission and we can share it and make sure that Josh and Jeff are aware of it too. Okay. Yeah, if you share it with the Civic, with myself and John, then we can, if it's more money, we can figure out how to, hmm. how to work with that. Yeah, and I think it's, it, just to be clear, I mean, the, the, the words that are on the plaques, the materials, all of those types of details are not something that the city needs to really weigh in on and, and go through our process on. It's just once we get some specifications of what we're going to be put, what's going to be put on those plaques and what the plaques are made out of and look like. We just want to make sure that we take that information, put it through the proper process to receive cost quotes and then award it through council through our process. And that's, that's I think, what Josh is referring to. And Jeff, are you talking about not only installing these plaques, but also the cost that you you would get the estimates for the creation of the correct all, all one. I mean, that's that's as Don was alluding to. I mean, it's the vendor would do all of that. I mean, the city oh. would not likely install them. We would, as part of those specifications, it would probably say something like, "Here are the dimensions of these pylons, okay. and here's what their materials are made out of. You're going to be required to have some security screws affixed to, bolt to, whatever into this concrete and." Okay. Um, and, and responsible for all that. And that's the cost would be for all of that. Okay, okay. One thing, I don't think it's gonna to have to go to um, council though, because uh, in 1184, council already, auth already authorized uh, educational uh, signage in this area. Okay. So, okay. And, and we've also, I've also met with Katrina, being that these pylons are already there, there's no permitting needed to so we just saved three years or something like that. <laughs> um, the last thing is, Dawn, when you said that you had talked to Stephanie Lyle and she has seen this, is that correct? Yes. If we just, again, just trying to make sure we cover our basis, uh, do you think we could get, do, do you know if she asked, if we could get something from the museum that they, they are okay with this? Um, Absolutely, I've asked. I've already received some feedback from uh, one of their researchers and uh, I've asked that she uh, proof it as well so that the museum is fully vetted in the project and she seemed to be agreeable because she knew that the one pylon is uh, on her property but and I'd hope she was able to attend the meeting but right if you need us you know um Obviously, we work with the museum with a variety of um, funding. If you need us to send a letter uh, to them asking them if they would support this and okay the pylon, you know, I think being the ones on their property, we needed something from them saying that they allow this. Um, I think they would do so, but I think that we would be happy to send them a letter off your guidance, but that way there's no hey, you put this on our property, there's no written document saying, you know, I think we need to cover ourselves. Right, now, uh, just, for, just for the record, I've been having close contact with Stephanie as well on behalf of the City and the Arts Commission. So I, I'm, it's kind of, maybe we're having a sort of a multi-prong approach to her. Right, we can almost do the same thing to the um, Parks Commission too, same kind of thing. Well, and that, that second pylon is actually on Perot property. So uh, I have had contact with uh, Michael Perot and you know maybe we can get a formal letter from them for the initial approval that I had. Okay. That's the one behind their building? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's make sure that we need to do that. I, I did ask Jeff during this meeting, are, are there 
pylons on other people's property and he thought it was just the museums. So um, just so we don't have to ask someone that we don't have to ask, whatever. Well, in any case, he said he's he's good with it. Okay. But. Okay. Again, something in if we get something back from them in writing, so that um, I've learned as being mayor, don't say, "Well, I told you." <laughs> yeah. Very Whatever. good. Good. Okay. Um, I th uh, is there any other discussion on this? Um, okay. So I guess we'll just set up a meeting then uh, with. Um, you know, myself and Samantha, Don, Linda, and and who whoever else I guess would like to be a part of that, just defining the the parameters a little more specifically. Yeah. When okay. Don, when can we get prices of all that? Kind of a, a complete price on what this is. Uh I can put together what I have and forward it. I mean, my contact has kind of been Lynn. So maybe Lynn can, then I'm only dealing with one sure. representative and she can pass it forward to Josh or Jeff or you or whatever. So like a couple of weeks, just so. Oh, oh, within a week. Okay. Okay. Um, are we ready to move on to our next topic? Since so it's. Um, after 1130. So one last thing, if, if this keeps going as it is, um, I see in the background uh, in, in Don's picture, you know, we're, we're hoping the honorary, and I, this is overzealous maybe, but uh, we're hoping that the honorary sculpture will be in, in September or October. You know, we hope that the voice box and the new sign will be there. Uh, it, to me, this is a huge kickoff of, uh, of of a type of um, uh, what it, not a ribbon cutting, but whatever you want to say, a gathering. And it, maybe, maybe we could, if we don't get those in time, which I'm sure we won't don, maybe if we use those behind and we put those uh, on the pylons just to show what's going to be there, you know, so, you, so when we have the honorary sculpture and we have the voice box and we have the toile cut, uh, estuary and then we have those beyond the pilings just temporarily saying this is what's coming in two months i mean it would be really exciting it would be fantastic and um not to oversimplify but the metal panels being engraved is probably one of the least expensive and easy to produce you could get so uh, i think we'd come out first place in timeline um but yeah, Great. it'd be exciting if it all came together. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dawn and um, Linda. And thank you so much to Charlotte, Jennifer, and Brandon. And of course, you're all welcome to uh, continue with us as we go through the meeting. But I think we are, um, uh, you're, you're welcome to go if you want. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Greatly Thank appreciate you. this. Thank you, Jennifer, Thank you. Charlotte, Brandon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Um, all right. So, uh, big accomplishment there. Thank you all very much, commissioners and uh, city staff. Um, so next item on our discussion agenda is the Harbor Arbor Art Project. And uh, again, this is um, our commissioner, Lynn Stevenson, taking the lead on this. And Lynn, you submitted a oh. proposal or a, a sort of a proposed location. Right, yeah. So you and wanna I, talk about that? I was hoping the mayor would stick around because he had a comment about this. I thought he was gonna stick around for this portion. Um, yeah, so, you know, we're in the middle of the year and we still have $5,000 um, that we could spend on another um, Harbor Arbor Art installation. And um, I've kind of, that's on me. I've sort of back burnered this. And what started out as my committee of four is now me because I lost some <laughs> commissioner, parks commissioners, arts commissioners. So, um, uh, and I've also just been a bit stumped, uh, so to speak about where to go next. Very um, funny. Uh -huh. <laughs> so 
so I thought I would just at least take this opportunity to, to bring it up, to propose something. The, what, what's happened is um, the Harbor Arbor Art idea was inspired by wa a walk through Grandview Forest because it was during a time a few, several years ago when a lot of trees were suffering from root rot and were dangerous. And so uh, the city hired um, companies to cut them down to the you know, snag heights. Um, that hasn't happened in maybe any other of city parks. So, um, and I was, you know, I presented this to the Parks Commission. Um, that was a couple of years ago now, I guess, and was asking them to keep an eye out in the other parks for potential sites for us. And, and nothing's come up. So it, what I thought I would do is either, um, I would, thought I would start here, present this. It's, it's sort of a, an obvious opportunity, but it's also real close to site number one. Um, and it's all in Grandview Forest Park, which is also site number two as well. But um, you can see if you can, oh, uh, if you guys haven't seen it, Josh, can you just pull up that one, one page of proposal that shows you a few pictures of different angles and gives you an idea of where this proposed site is in relation to site number one. Okay, um, give me one moment. I'll have it. It's the last. Yeah. So you see there in the bottom on the on the bottom right with the animals carved in there, that's site number one, which is right near the public restroom, which is off, off there to the right. Um, and as you walk down that paved trail, you'll see this proposed site with those two snags there, a snag and a stump. So I call that the bonus stump because it's right there. Um, it could be part of the project or it could be optional for an artist to, to have a vision with, you know, how those two, those two could work together. Um, I say the condition of the tree is unknown. That's just to say that I don't know how degraded this particular snag is. So, you know, someone could just start poking into it and it might be, um, it might have softened and decayed too much to actually carve. But um, that's something that an artist who's proposing working on it would have to come inspect first. So what do you guys think? It's, it's, it's easily accessible. It's much shorter. The last project, the guy needed to, um, George Kenny had to rent a, this big lift with a bucket. So uh, this would be much, much more simple. In fact, I think last year's snag collection, we paid $4,500 for. Um, our budget, budget is 5,000. Um, and the last couple of proposals came in a little less than that. And I would expect that this could come in less than that, depending on the artist, the carver, and the, the concept. Right. Lynn, could the, um, it looks like there's a, a a log laying down in the vicinity of these two, mm -hmm. the, the stump and the bonus. Yeah. Could that be included in part of the pallet? Yeah. yeah, it could, it could. It's a nice looking log. It's a, it's a big log. It'd make a really good bench too. I was, I was walking mm -hmm. through a, another park somewhere and I saw where they took a, a similar log and they just cut out, cut out a, a nice slice of it. And then they pulled that slice down onto the ground which made a little step up or a little footrest or something. So and that was a fun idea, but it could be, I, um, it could be, I guess my only hesitation is, do we open that up? Um, I, as much as I love this project, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily committed to carving everything in sight. So I want to discuss it. You know, there could be something cool with that. It could be a very simple carved bench, you know, just that real simple thing. But of course that's open to artistic 
uh, um, artistic interpretation, artistic um, proposals. Yeah. yeah. Uh, commissioners, any any discussion? Well, I, I, have one, I think Lynn just kind of alluded to it. So, you know, last year when I came on board, the the carving project was kind of underway for that second site. So this funding for Harbor Art, is it more expansive than simply doing wood carvings in the trees so we could open it to a broader range of bids, I guess is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jennifer, I mean, ideally this project, it's it from the beginning was about trying to entice any kind of artistic expression. Okay. Um, it doesn't even, it could be conceptual. Um, there, the parameters are, you know, that we don't want it to be, uh, use any toxic, um, kind of toxic materials. We, the idea is that the, the snags will decay in place. Uh, there's not a lot of parameters. I mean, I guess people could present anything and then we would have to decide if it, if it fits within the scope, but yeah, I would, ideally love to have other ideas. I think carving is the most obvious, um, but yeah, it would be great if, if people could present other interesting, you know, concept. People could, co could collect twigs and branches and, and sculpt them around these and, or work them into it. I mean, it's open to so, so much potential but we, it has, that hasn't been presented to us. So yeah, I think the word has to get out and to inspire some more creative thinking. Right. Just to clarify that the city's budget is 5,500 for this and it, it is limited to tree stumps and city parks. So um, I think in future budgets, which we'll discuss next, you could expand that program, but in the, specifically in the city's budget, it's, it's limited to the tree stumps and city parks or rights of way. Right, right. Oh, wait, did I misunderstand some the question then? Sorry. No, I think I I think I think we're all on the same page. Okay. Um, thanks, Josh. Was it is it, okay, you said the budget's 5,500? Yeah, that's what was approved for this year. Oh my God. Thank you for clarifying that. I I overlooked that one. It's 5,500. How do we manage that? Good for us. I I, I thought I looked at the last budget. Um, Josh, uh, it's five thousand. It's I'm I'm the budget that I'm looking for that you sent us is five thousand. Oh well, let me show you the the actual adopted budget. I may have sent you the wrong thing. Do they give us more than we asked for? Uh, they may have. <laughs> I felt generous. They've set precedent if they did. <laughs> As a typo. Number Wait, four, yeah. Harbor Arbor Art. That does say 5,500. Yeah, something must oh. have changed from what you submitted to what finance adopted. Oh, so. so we don't have that. Hmm. Great. Thank you. I looked at the file I had that I think even said final on it. Yeah. So, yeah, no. Um, God. Okay, thanks for that. Excellent. Yeah, the one that you sent us, Josh, isn't that one. Okay, well, this is the one that you should have gotten. Um, okay. okay. I, I pulled the one that said final two from the from finances budget documents, but apparently <laughs> it changed. This is the actual budget that was approved. Oh, great. Okay. For the wow. Whole city. Wow. Great. Bonus. Okay. Yeah. Well, and this is, and as Lynn was saying, so far, this is the only park that we've, or that she has found. Um, that or others that um, has um, a qualifying stumps and snags in it. So we have asked the public works department to when they're getting ready to do the clearing for the sports complex, if they have to cut trees or when they have to cut trees, we've requested that they save some snags for this project. But um, I, I don't know what the status of that is, Josh, do you? I don't know, no. Sports complex, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that they've started cutting trees yet. No. Oh, yeah, I don't think so. 
No, they haven't. And we'll we'll just have to remind them before that happens. Well, I'm sure we'll have to remind them again. But I we did get a message from the mayor about the Harbor Arbor Art um, right before our meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, and because I know he's just concerned about having, you know, too many of those things in one park. And ideally, we could find locations in um, in all the parks. But um, what did he say? Oh, shoot. Yeah, I was I'm looking for that. I, I was hoping he would chime in here uh, on the record. That as um, this is like a collection, you know, it, it makes more. Um, it gives you more strength uh, if you have it all in one spot. Yeah, yeah. there, there mm -hmm. is something really fun about that walking down the path. That's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah here's, here's, I agree with I agree with Linda on this. I I I don't think there's any problem. I think that actually even the angle of that picture that they'd look nice together. Huh. I mean, we yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. This, here's what the mayor said. Um, right before our meeting. Uh, Arts Commission, though I like the stump idea Lynn has given us, should we look at other parks that do not have any carved art before we add to a park that already has many of them, like Veterans Park, right of way, location stumps, Soundview Forest, etc. Just a thought to discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I, I agree, this, is, this becomes sort of an art park. Yeah, um, and we've discussed it. So, but we are moving on. <laughs> yeah. Right. Noted. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think also when you do have uh, two sites like that in proximity to each other, it it reminds people that oh, there's there's a collection here. Like there's maybe there's more to discover. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that could be an advantage as well. Right. Right. Yeah. So my only concern is that by $5,500 seems like just a whole lot of money to spend on one, maybe two, maybe three um, um, stumps. Yeah, I, but it, it's when you think about the, the past two projects were done by George Kenny and, and his bids came under that for uh well, the second one was way more elaborate, right? So, or at least what he had to work with was much more daunting. But um, again, it depends on the, I would rely on the artist to come in at a fair bid. Um, you know, if we, if we did attract, like my goal from the beginning was to attract the likes of our local internationally famous carver, Jeff Samodowski. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm, I don't know what money he makes, but this is a drop in the bucket for him. So um, I'm hoping this might be a little carrot that he, he would yeah, that's true. respond to. Uh, so uh, yes, I agree. It is. It's kind of like, well, that sounds like a lot of money for this. And, um, but it is just sort of the, the scope we have to work with. It doesn't mean that is what we will spend. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. Um, Dan, did you have a comment? I'm sorry. Dan was saying something. Yeah. I, I was just saying that if they like this park and they come up with some more money, we can do more parks. Yeah, the yeah. we can definitely do more parks. The nice to propose a, a scheme uh, to get a, a certain percentage of all city contracts to fund part for those projects. Oh yeah. Um. Well, yeah, and I think maybe this that could come into play for the sport. Well, no, I don't want to talk about the sports complex. I don't, I don't know, but yeah, for sure. We can we can discuss that possibility in our next topic, Dan. And I think it's worth visiting again. A, a percent for art. A percent for art works. Art works. Yeah. Um, on one hand. Obviously, time is a little bit of the essence for this year's budget if we're going to get a project underway, and there's definitely snags in Grandview Park. But would it be, um, and maybe this has already kind of been done by you, Lynn, or others, um, would it be something that we should each take like a, a park in the city and 
each of us go visit one and kind of do an inventory of possible harbor art that we think could happen there? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> that, I mean, you know, like I said, I feel like I, I dropped the ball. I didn't, I didn't replenish my committee. And um, yeah, uh, we could do that. I mean, if you want to put this discussion on hold until our next meeting, and then until then, we kind of all go explore some parks. I was just thinking if we each get assigned one or something, it, or for people who are willing to go out and look like if so we're not doubling up and just all visiting the same parks. Yeah. Um, yeah. We should send send the mayor to Veterans Park since he mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, where is our list of city parks? Well, I think maybe that's something. Can we do that, Josh, legally online? Each pick a park, or do we have to do it in a public meeting? Um, I think if you want to email the committee and just let the committee know which park you're going to take up, that's fine. We won't have any back and forth response. Just let them know which park you're going to, and then the others can select a different park and let everyone know. Um, yeah, as be long as it's not a dialogue and discussion, that's fine. Okay, great. I think that'd be a real efficient way to do it, Lynn. People could just say, oh, I'll do this one, I'll do this one. Great. Good idea. Good idea. Okay, so so we'll do a little research uh, and talk about it at our next meeting about right. getting a request for uh, art out there. Okay. Right. Lynn, and could you track down the um, the list of parks and that could be eligible, and um, that way we will have something to to go by. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Any other discussion on the um, Harbor Arbor Art Project? Um, Charlie, if I could just um, just be a little bit candid, uh, this will probably relate to our next discussion too, but um, we are going to have some staffing issues here at the city as far as staff support. Um, you know, Molly has been staffing the Arts Commission for a while, but we've lost the assistant quick position for the next nine to 12 months. Um, and the Arts Commission is actually supposed to be under the parks division, which is completely unstaffed at this point. Um, but hopefully beginning that first year, we'll be bringing those back up to speed. So projects like, you know, the Harbor Arbor, where Molly's got procedures in place, I think I can figure out what she's doing on those and pick them up. Um, but in all of the things that I'm doing and the parks department is doing, Jeff's doing, we are having to prioritize and drop things. And, and it's, you know, it's not the way we don't want to operate, but um, just so that you have a heads up as we're thinking about the budget for next year that we're probably not going to be back to full staff until well into 2022. Okay. So um, just I'm not saying we can't do anything or we won't be able to do anything. Just keep that in mind, I think, with your expectations. Right, right, right. So, Josh, and, and let me ask a question about something you just said. The Arts Commission is supposed to be under the Parks Commission. Um, not under the Parks Commission, the Parks Department. So when we get a Parks oh, Manager, um, okay. they will probably be taking over my job, staffing you and supporting you, um, because most That's of what you do is parks related. Um, it's actually yeah. in our municipal code that the Arts Commission is part of the Parks Department, and your budget is actually part of the Parks Department budget. Yes, so, right. Uh, just FYI, the cultural, our cultural plan suggests we be not under the parks because it's not just parks we do. Okay. Well, that's probably a larger discussion for the city council to take. Yes. <laughs> right, yeah. And, yeah. and we're going to be discussing that at the special meeting next week, our comp plan um, um, proposal. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Josh. Yeah, that's a good point, good point. Um, so any other stump discussion? We now have five minutes to talk about the next year's budget. Uh, Josh, could you put back up that one that you had that has the actual approved budget, yes. that visual? One second here. You should have it now. There we go, okay. Um, so 
we could we can maybe run through this really quickly commissioners and um kind of just eyeball it um i in terms of what do we want to request funds for for next year and i think um Creative endeavor support is definitely one that we want. Um, Shirley, Shirley, yeah. per yeah. my earlier request last year when we were discussing the budget, can I make a motion that we discuss the budget in um, coordination with our comp plan? Because our budget really needs to resolve or follow our strategic plan and not just what we've done in the past. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I would agree with that because I'm looking at, you know, the, the uh, cultural planning and all of that. And I think we want to bring in new things and some of these things are going to come off. So right. um, can we, maybe Charlie, we, do we need a special meeting? When is the budget due? A budget is due October, jo Josh? Oh, the budget will be proposed to council on September 30th. So you'll have to work backwards from there and get something into the mayor before September 30th. So right. either to have a special budget meeting or table this to the whole next meeting. Right. And that's a good idea because we're next week, we're having a special meeting on the comp plan. And yeah. it, it's possible that our discussion next week might influence what we're going to be putting into our budget. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I think it's, we should wait and, um, you know, so we have so we have a, a time, a small window, but I, I, yeah, I think we're going to want to revisit this. So um, I agree with Samantha. Great. Okay. So um, Josh, would you put this as our um, main discussion item for our August meeting? Yep. I will move it on to that agenda. Thank you. And we also, what else was it that we moved to to August? Harbor Arbor Art. Right. And something earlier, I thought. Uh, we talked about moving the Harbor Review Stinson Roundabout Art update to August, but Jeff yes. is available, so that will probably be September. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was it. Um, okay. So uh, no further discussion on the budget at this point. Um, Commissioner Avni, you attended a um, presentation at the History Museum about the creative or cultural districts programs. Well, actually, do you want to get about the cultural districts program, the creative district? That's that's different. Josh, I okay. sent an email. Could you pop up that uh, slide deck? Yeah, I'm not going to go through it. I just want to give everybody a quick overview and and um, of what the meeting was about. Um, it's a, an it actually has to do with, well, once Josh gets it up there, it's, I want to make sure I phrase it right. Do you see my email, Josh? There we go. So it's about forming a tax district for ongoing okay. support. And Josh, if you could click through to the next one, I'm going to have you click through real quick, but just go to the next slide. So there's three diff there's different kinds of funding. So keep going, Josh. Next one, next one. Basically what Stephanie's trying to do is there's this legislation out to create a taxing district to broaden community dollar support. So it's similar to other, like a school tax or a sales tax. So next, next slide. And there's different types of, of taxing districts. So next slide, please, Josh. And next slide. So this idea is to take a taxing district. It imposes a levy on property or sales tax. So I will give my personal opinion and then I will open it to the floor. But first of all, it's going to take a lot of legwork to get. This is really something that is um, similar to the cultural access plan, which Tacoma did um, successfully, which is um, there's only been one that is passed statewide, and that is in Tacoma. 
and or um, the Cultural Arts Stadium and Convention District. And right now there are zero in Washington State that have passed. Um, now, these are some of the other levies that have gone through. I have to say my personal opinion at this point is I do not see wanting to put a tax for arts out there as being part of a uh, property or sales tax. Um, I, I worked diligently for the school one. Um, I actually wrote a lot of the material for it and um, because we had like grade schoolers in portables, right? And I realized what Stephanie is trying to get a group together to do is to help the future support of museums. Um, FYI, as work on the State Arts Commission, we are actually, there is another round of funding coming for post-pandemic um, because the, the NEA realizes that we need to continue to help arts organizations even once they open up. I know fundraising is an issue for all the museums. Uh, Stephanie did two of these with different groups around the area. Um, you know, if all of you are interested in helping to pursue this further, I am happy to have Stephanie come in and talk to us about it. It needs a lot of grassroots support and it needs a lot of legwork. Um, so I'm trying to be brief here. I'm not trying to cut anybody off, but if I'm gonna stop now and see if you have any questions or thoughts on this. Any questions or thoughts? Is there a proposal that we're supposed to be considering for this or is this just an FYI of what? Well, it would be, it'd have to get on a ballot by October, which is crazy. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to share the slide deck with you guys. I'll have Josh send it out. You could send out that and the note, Josh, that I sent you um, so everyone can see. Um, but what it is, is you have to, my understanding, we have to get a bunch of people together to work on a proposal of what the district would actually be and then begin to lobby for it. Mm. If I could just throw a couple things out as well. Um, so yeah, there would be, it would be a collaborative effort for creating the comprehensive plan that goes together with the taxing district. Um, but one of the things that I think is worth consideration, whether it makes it onto the ballot this October or in sometime in the future, it's one thing to have, you know, these different entities for cultural arts or heritage type things. But a lot of these plans are just plans and ideal, idealistic ideas of things we want in our community, but there's no money supporting it. And, um, this particular tax proposal is not just for museums. It's really for any right. Thank you, Jennifer. cultural yeah. organization that operates their own buildings. So, and then there could be granting opportunities to extend beyond that reach to people who might not be operating their own facilities but are providing public programming type services. So it, it's more encompassing than just museums, I guess. Yeah, thank you. To, yeah. Yeah, to have some stability and funding because it's really, um, as we all know, being on that hamster wheel of fundraising can, especially in times like this, then makes it almost impossible to deliver programming. And it's um, be nice to have some other ideas for fundraising yeah. <laughs> or, or, or consistent support. And I thank you, Jennifer, for adding that it's not just museums. Um, I was trying to do this all so quickly. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Um, and I did stay up front. I do have a bias against putting another tax out there but that I'm not the only vote on this commission. So I and know. Stephanie would be happy to present to anybody. Yes. So yes, exactly. I, I think what may make sense, having been involved in both the Tacoma vote um, and the failed Seattle vote that they're trying to, to renegotiate. Um, this takes a lot longer than three months. Um, I think it's ambitious to think we'll get it, even if it moves forward exactly. with, without our support by October. Um, but I think if the Arts Commission is both not aware of it and not in support of this, that says a lot. So I wonder if um, we could schedule maybe for our September meeting, um, since we have a lot to discuss in August, for Stephanie to come and just I get think that'd be great. It. And then we can decide what, what needs to happen with it. That being said, having seen what has happened with the last school votes, um, I don't think there is much support in Gig Harbor for any more taxes. So I agree. And that's really where I'm coming from. 
um, all yeah. with it. Not that I don't believe in supporting museums, art organizations, cultural art, any of it. Um, I was very involved in the King County Cultural Art Access Program. Which is still, uh, what, three years, four years later, still trying right. to make it um, right. to come, a, to so, come a from that, but it still took them two, two, three years to get theirs passed. Right. So, no, I'm very much in support of that. My point in bringing up the schools was, I think there is limited capacity for throwing a tax, any more tax right now on the taxpayers. Um, but I, irregardless, Stephanie should come to present She's ambitious, has great ideas, and is always trying to find innovative ways to get money. So I always admire and support her for that. So let's there's, invite her to There's no time her. limit on this. So yeah. let's let's think about it as a future um, future conversation. Excellent. Let's, um, Josh, can you make a note, and I'll try to as well, to put this, to invite Stephanie uh, Lyle, the museum director, to make this presentation to the Arts Commission in September? Yeah, I'll get, uh, get that on the agenda for September. Great, thank you. And thank you, thank you. For clarity for some of the newer members, the Cultural Arts District is another, is a statewide effort from the Cultural Art, from the Washington State Arts Commission. And that's more offers more of a grant opportunity, but not sustained support like this would be. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, any other discussion on this? Are there any other uh, commissioner comments or reports? Our creative endeavor grants are hard at work. Um, I understand that the poetry, Jennifer Kushoff's poetry project is up and running um, along with a little poems on um, uh, little signs along Donkey Creek, and that will culminate in October. Um, the Gnomes project is about to start up another round. Um, uh, United by Music had a wonderfully successful Make Music Day on the solstice. It was incredibly hot, but there was a lot of music made. Uh, and the tribe came to do to participate in the opening ceremony and they did a um, a blessing and a dance to remind people that um, this was originally squabosh land and um, to kind of bless the whole uh, area and the activities so that was wonderfully successful um, and uh, things are moving on any other commissioner comments or Things coming up. All right, seeing none, um, may I have a motion to adjourn? Well, first, let me remind you that we are meeting again um, next week. Is it the 22nd, Josh? Friday, Friday the 23rd. Friday the 23rd, a special meeting at which we will discuss our, um, with the planning department, or I'm sorry, the cultural so develop, community development department will be discussing our proposed comp plan amendment. That's a very important meeting. And I hope that everyone can come because what we learn at that meeting will influence what we talk about at the next meeting, which will be our budget. And, do we and, need to prep for that? How do we prep for that meeting? Just read the cultural, um, the, the amendment that we have proposed. Uh, I'm not sure what changes they're going to be making. I do know that the consultant and Carl DeSimis from the um, planning department um, said that they were going to be interviewing uh, others who participated in the development of our proposed amendment and other commissioners. And um, uh, I have not heard from, have spoken with Carl for a couple of weeks. So I'm pres presuming that those interviews have taken place or are taking place. And we will learn more about um, any changes that the consultant might be proposing or strategies. Um, we'll all be learning together. So um, very important meeting. Yeah, uh, uh, Charlie, I need to hook up with him, right? Yeah, oh yes. Okay. So um, I'm, I've been a little, I've been, traveling a lot so i'm a little cattywampus at this point um but 
I, I, I will and will work to hook up with him. Thank you. Thank you. It's real important. Your, I mean, your comments are so important, Robin, because you were so um, involved in uh, leading that effort. You and me sitting elbow to elbow, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, anything else? If not, may I have a, me a motion to adjourn? I'll uh, make a motion to adjourn. Uh, Dan seconds. Uh, all right. Um, I'm assuming everyone will say aye. And all, all in favor, yes. At uh, 12, 12 a.m. or 12, 12 p.m. on um, Wednesday, July 14th, 2021, we are adjourned. <laughs>